Act Three, Scene One, Macbeth's Palace at Forres. Thou hast it now, King, Cawdor, Gloms, all as the weird women promised, and I fear thou plaidst most foully for it. Yet it was said it should not stand in thy posterity, but that myself should be the root and father of many kings. If there come truth from them, as upon thee Macbeth their speeches shine, why, by the verities on thee made good, may they not be my oracles as well and set me up in hope? But hush, no more. Here's our chief guest. If he had been forgotten, it had been as a gap in our great feast and all thing unbecoming. Tonight we hold a solemn supper, sir, and I'll request your presence. Let your highness command upon me, to the which my duties are with the most indissoluble tie forever knit. Ride you this afternoon. Aye, my good lord. We should have else desired your good advice, which still hath been both grave and prosperous in this day's council. But we'll take tomorrow. Is it far you ride? As far, my lord, as will fill up the time twixt this and supper. Go not my horse the better, I must become a borrower of the night for a dark hour or twain. Fail not our feast. My lord, I will not. We hear our bloody cousins are bestowed in England and in Ireland, not confessing their cruel parricide, filling their hearers with strange invention. But of that tomorrow, when therewithal we shall have cause of state craving us jointly. Hie you to horse. Adieu. Till you return at night. Goes Fleance with you. Aye, my good lord. Our time does call upon us. I wish your horses swift and sure of foot, and so I do commend you to their backs. Farewell. Let every man be master of his time till seven at night, to make society the sweeter welcome. We will keep ourselves till supper time alone. While then, God be with you. Sirrah, a word with you. Attend those men our pleasure. They are, my lord, without the palace gate. Bring them before us. To be thus is nothing, but to be safely thus. Our fears in Banquo stick deep, and in his royalty of nature reigns that which would be feared. Tis much he dares, and to that dauntless temper of his mind he hath a wisdom that doth guide his valor to act in safety. There is none but he whose being I do fear, and under him my genius is rebuked. As it is said, Mark Antony's was by Caesar. He chid the sisters when first they put the name of king upon me and bade them speak to him. Then, prophet-like, they hailed him father to a line of kings. Upon my head they placed a fruitless crown and put a barren scepter in my grip, thence to be wrenched with an unlineal hand, no son of mine succeeding. If it be so, for Banquo's issue have I filed my mind. For them the gracious Duncan have I murdered, put rancors in the vessel of my peace only for them, and mine eternal jewel given to the common enemy of man to make them kings, the seed of Banquo kings. Rather than so, come fate into the list and champion me to the utterance. Who's there? Now go to the door and stay there till we call. Was it not yesterday we spoke together? It was, it was so, so please, please your, your highness. highness. Well then, now have you considered of my speeches? Know that it was he in the times past which held you so under fortune, which you thought had been our innocent self. This I made good to you in our last conference, passed in probation with you how you were born in hand, how crossed the instruments, who wrought with them, and all things else that might to half a soul and to a notion craze say, thus did Banquo. You made it known to us. I did so, and went further, which is now our point of second meeting. Do you find your patience so predominant in your nature that you can let this go? Are you so gospel to pray for this good man and for his issue, whose heavy hand hath bowed you to the grave and beggared yours forever? We are men, my liege. Aye, in the catalogue you go for men, 
as hounds and greyhounds, mongrels, spaniels, curs, shuffs, water rugs, and demi wolves are clept all by the name of dogs. The valued file distinguishes the swift, the slow, the subtle, the housekeeper, the hunter, every one according to the gift which bounteous nature hath in him closed, whereby he does receive particular addition from the bill that writes them all alike, and so of men. Now if you have a station in the file, not in the worst rank of manhood, say it, and I will put that business in your bosoms, whose execution takes your enemy off, grapples you to the heart and love of us, who wear our health but sickly in his life, which in his death were perfect. I am one, my liege, whom the vile blows and buffets of the world have so incensed that I am reckless what I do to spite the world. And I another, so weary with disasters, tugged with fortune, that I would set my life on any chance to mend it or be rid on't. Both of you know Banquo was your enemy. True, True, my lord. So is he mine, and in such bloody distance that every minute of his being thrusts against my nearest of life, and though I could with barefaced power sweep him from my sight and bid my will avouch it, yet I must not. For certain friends that are both his and mine, whose loves I may not drop, but wail his fall who I myself struck down. And thence it is that I to your assistance do make love, masking the business from the common eye for sundry weighty reasons. We shall, my lord, perform what you command us. Though our lives... Your spirits shine through you. Within this hour at most, I will advise you where to plant yourselves, acquaint you with the perfect spy of the time, the moment on't, for it must be done tonight. And something from the palace always thought that I require a clearness, and with him to leave no rubs nor botches in the work, Fleance his son that keeps him company, whose absence is no less material to me than is his father's, must embrace the fate of that dark hour. Resolve yourselves apart. I'll come to you anon. We, we are, are resolved, resolved, my, my lord. lord. I'll call upon you straight. Abide within. It is concluded. Banquo, thy soul's flight, if it find heaven, must find it out tonight. Scene 2. Macbeth's Palace at Forest. Is Banquo gone from court? Aye, madam, but returns again tonight. Say to the king I would attend his leisure for a few words. Madam, I will. Not sad. All spent where our desire is got without content. Tis safer to be that which we destroy than by destruction dwell in doubtful joy. How now, my lord? Why do you keep alone? Of sorriest fancies your companions making, using those thoughts which should indeed have died with them they think on. Things without all remedy should be without regard. What's done is done. We have scotched the snake, not killed it. She'll close and be herself whilst our poor malice remains in danger of her former tooth. But let the frame of things disjoint. Both the worlds suffer ere we will eat our meal in fear and sleep in the affliction of these terrible dreams that shake us nightly. Better be with the dead, whom we, to gain our peace, have sent to peace, than on the torture of the mind to lie in restless ecstasy. Duncan is in his grave. After life's fitful fever, he sleeps well. Treason has done his worst, nor steel, nor poison, malice domestic, foreign levy, nothing can touch him further. Come on. Gentle, my lord, sleek o'er your rugged looks. Be bright and jovial among your guests tonight. So shall I love. And so I pray be you. Let your remembrance apply to Banquo. Present him eminence both with eye and tongue. Unsafe the while that we must lave our honors in these flattering streams and make our faces vizards to our hearts, disguising what they are. You must leave this. Oh, full of scorpions is my mind, dear wife. Thou knowst that Banquo and his fleance lives. But in them nature's copies not a turn. There's comfort yet. They are assailable. 
Then be thou jocund, ere the bat hath flown his cloistered flight, ere to black Hecate's summons the shard-born beetle with his drowsy hums hath rung night's yawning peal. There shall be done a deed of dreadful note. What's to be done? Be innocent of the knowledge, dearest Chuck, till thou applaud the deed. Come, sealing night, scarf up the tender eye of pitiful day, and with thy bloody and invisible hand cancel and tear to pieces that great bond which keeps me pale. Light thickens, and the crow makes wing to the rookie wood. Good things of day begin to droop and drowse, whilst night's black agents to their praise do rouse. Thou marvelest at my words, but hold thee still. Things bad begun make strong themselves by ill. So prithee go with me. Scene three. A park near the palace. But who did bid thee join with us? Macbeth. He needs not our mistrust, since he delivers our offices, and what we have to do to the direction just. Then stand with us. The west yet glimmers with some streaks of day. Now spurs the lated traveler apace to gain the timely inn, and near approaches the subject of our watch. Hark! I hear horses. Give us a light there. Ho! Then tis he. The rest that are within the note of expectation already are in the court. His horses go about. Almost a mile, but he does usually. So all men do from hence to the palace gate make it their walk. A light! A light! Tis he! Stand to it. It will be rain tonight. Let it come down! Oh, treachery! Fly, good fleance! Fly, fly, fly! Else mace revenge! Oh, slave! Who did strike out the light? Was not the way. There's but one down. The sun is fled. We have lost best half of our affair. Well, let's away and say how much is done. Scene four. The hall in the palace. You know your own degrees. Sit down. At first and last, the hearty welcome. Thanks, Thanks to your majesty. majesty. Ourself will mingle with society and play the humble host. Our hostess keeps her state, but in best time we will require her welcome. Pronounce it for me, sir, to all our friends, for my heart speaks they are welcome. See, they encounter thee with their heart's thanks. Both sides are even. Here I'll sit in the midst. Be large in mirth. Anon we'll drink a measure the table round. There's blood upon thy face. Tis bank was then. Tis better thee without than he within. Is he dispatched? My lord, his throat is cut. That I did for him. Thou art the best of the cutthroats. Yet he's good that did the like for Fleance. If thou didst it, thou art the nonpareil. Most royal sir, Fleance escaped. Then comes my fit again. I had else been perfect. Whole as the marble, founded as the rock, as broad and general as the casing air. But now I am cabined, cribbed, confined, bound in to saucy doubts and fears. But Banquo safe. Aye, my good lord, safe in a ditch he bides with twenty trenched gashes on his head, the least a death to nature. Thanks for that. There the grown serpent lies. The worm that's fled hath nature that in time will venom breed. No teeth for the present. Get thee gone. Tomorrow we'll hear ourselves again. My royal lord, you do not give the cheer. The feast is sold that is not often vouched. While tis a making, tis given with welcome. To feed were best at home. From thence the sauce to meet is ceremony. Meeting were bare without it. Sweet remembrance, sir. Now good digestion wait on appetite, and health on both. May it please your highness sit. Here had we now our country's honor roofed were the graced person of our Banquo present, who may I rather challenge for unkindness than pity for mischance. His absence, sir, lays blame upon his promise. Pleased your highness to grace us with your royal company. The table's full. Here is a place reserved, sir. Where? Here, my good lord. What is that moves, your highness? Which of you have done this? What, what my, my good lord? lord? 
Thou canst not say I did it. Never shake thy gory locks at me. Gentlemen, rise. His highness is not well. Sit, worthy friends. My lord is often thus and hath been from his youth. Pray you keep seat. The fit is momentary. Upon a thought he will again be well. If much you note him, you shall offend him and extend his passion. Feed and regard him not. Are you a man? Aye, and a bold one that dare look on that which might appall the devil. Oh, proper stuff. This is the very painting of your fear. This is the air-drawn dagger which you said led you to Duncan. Oh, these flaws and starts, impostors to true fear, would well become a woman's story at a winter's fire authorized by her grandam. Shame itself! Why do you make such faces? When all's done, you look but on a stool. Prithee, see there? Behold, look. Lo, how say you? Why, what care I? If thou canst nod, speak too. If charnel houses and our graves must send those that we bury back, our monument shall be the maws of kites. What, quite unmanned in folly? If I stand here, I saw him. I for shame. Blood hath been shed ere now. In the olden time, ere humane statute purged the gentle wheel. Ay, and since too, murders have been performed, too terrible for the ear. The time has been that when the brains were out, the man would die and there an end. But now they rise again with twenty mortal murders on their crowns and push us from our stools. This is more strange than such a murder is. My worthy lord, your noble friends do lack you. I do forget. Do not muse at me, my most worthy friends. I have a strange infirmity which is nothing to those that know me. Come, love and health to all. Then I'll sit down. Give me some wine, fill full. I drink to the general joy of the whole table, and to our dear friend Banquo, whom we miss. Would he were here? To all and him we thirst, and all to all. Our duties and the pledge. Avaunt and quit my sight. Let the earth hide thee. Thy bones are marrowless. Thy blood is gold. Thou hast no speculation in those eyes which thou dost glare with. Think of this good beers, but as a thing of custom. Tis no other. Only it spoils the pleasure of the time. What man dare, I dare. Approach thou like the rugged Russian bear. The armed rhinoceros or the hurricane tiger. Take any shape but that, and my firm nerves shall never tremble. Or be alive again, and dare me to the desert with thy sword. If trembling I inhabit then, protest me the baby of a girl. Hence, horrible shadow. Unreal mockery, hence. Why so? Being gone, I am a man again. Pray you sit still. You have displaced the mirth, broke the good meeting with most admired disorder. Can such things be, and overcome us like a summer's cloud without our special wonder? You make me strange, even to the disposition that I owe, when now I think you can behold such sights and keep the natural ruby of your cheeks when mine is blanched with fear. What sights, my lord? I pray you, speak not. He grows worse and worse. Question enrages him. At once, good night. Stand not upon the order of your going, but go at once. Good night, and better health attend his majesty. A kind good night to all. It will have blood, they say. Blood will have blood. Stones have been known to move and trees to speak. Augurs and understood relations have by maggot pies and chuffs and rooks brought forth the secretest man of blood. What is the night? Almost at odds with morning, which is which? How sayest thou that Macduff denies his person at our great bidding? Did you send to him, sir? I hear it by the way, but I will send. There's not a one of them, but in his house I keep a servant feed. I will tomorrow, and betimes I will, to the weird sisters. More shall they speak, for now I am bent to know by the worst means the worst. For mine own good, all causes shall give way. I am in blood, stepped in so far that should I wade no more, returning were as tedious as go o'er. 
Strange things I have in head that will to hand, which must be acted ere they may be scanned. You lack the season of all nature's sleep. Come, will to sleep. My strange and self-abuse is the initiate fear that wants hard use. We are yet but young indeed. Scene 5. A Heath. Why, how now, Hecate? You look angrily. Have I not reason, beldams as you are, saucy and overbold? How did you dare to trade and traffic with Macbeth in riddles and affairs of death? And I, the mistress of your charms, the close contriver of all harms, was never called to bear my part or show the glory of our art. And, which is worse, all you have done hath been but for a wayward son, spiteful and wrathful, who, as others do, loves for his own ends, not for you. But make amends now, get you gone, and at the pit of Acheron, meet me in the morning, thither he will come to know his destiny. Your vessels and your spells provide, your charms and everything beside. I am for the air this night I'll spend, and to a dismal and a fatal end. Great business must be wrought ere noon. Upon the corner of the moon there hangs a vaporous drop profound. I'll catch it ere it come to ground. And that distilled by magic slights shall raise such artificial sprites as by the strength of their illusion shall draw him on to his confusion. He shall spurn fate, scorn death, and bear his hopes of wisdom, grace, and fear. And you all know security is mortal's chiefest enemy. Hark! I am called. My little spirit sea sits in a foggy cloud and stays for me. Come, let's make haste. She'll soon be back again. Scene 6. The Palace at Forest. My former speeches have but hit your thoughts which can interpret farther. Only I say things have been strangely born. The gracious Duncan was pitied of Macbeth. Mary, he was dead. And the right valiant Banquo walked too late. Whom you may say, if it please you, Fleance killed, for Fleance fled. Men must not walk too late. Who cannot want the thought how monstrous it was for Malcolm and for Donalbane to kill their gracious father? Damned fact! How it did grieve Macbeth! Did he not straight in pious rage the two delinquents tear that were the slaves of drink and thralls of sleep? Was not that nobly done? Aye, and wisely, too, for twould have angered any heart alive to hear the men deny it. So that I say he has borne all things well, and I do think that, had he Duncan's sons under his key, as, an it please heaven he shall not, they should find what twere to kill a father. So should Fleance. But peace. For from broad words, and cause he failed his presence at the tyrant's feast, I hear Macduff lives in disgrace. Sir, can you tell where he bestows himself? The son of Duncan, from whom this tyrant holds the due of birth, lives in the English court, and is received of the most pious Edward with such grace that the malevolence of fortune nothing takes from his high respect. Thither Macduff is gone, to pray the holy king upon his aid to wake Northumberland and warlike Seward, that by the help of these, with him above to ratify the work, we may again give to our tables meat, sleep to our nights, free from our feasts and banquets bloody knives, do faithful homage and receive free honors, all which we pine for now. And this report hath so exasperate the king that he prepares for some attempt of war. Sent he to Macduff? He did. 
and with an absolute sir not I, the cloudy messenger turns me his back and hums, as who should say, you'll rue the time that clogs me with this answer. And that well might advise him to a caution to hold what distance his wisdom can provide. Some holy angel fly to the court of England and unfold his message ere he come, that a swift blessing may soon return to this our suffering country under a hand accursed. I'll send my prayers with him.